what we do every day is we're looking at students who want better lives. They're in a system that's not completely rational because it's underfunded, right? Mm -hmm. The poorest as they are, the less support they're, the less subsidy they get. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make a better life for themselves. They've sacrificed to get there. We're the doorkeeper. I'm Richard Moore. This is The Pathfinder the podcast where we visit with faculty, administrators, policymakers, researchers, really anyone making a difference in the lives of students at community colleges. It's a partnership between the Texas Success Center and the Texas Community College Teachers Association. Today, Uri Treisman is with us to talk about his career as a teacher and researcher and what he's been up to lately, changing the way we all think about mathematics in higher education. Uri is a professor of mathematics and public policy at the University of Texas at Austin and the founder of the Charles A. Dana Center, a research unit of the College of Natural Sciences at UT. Through the Dana Center and through his teaching, he's taken a good hard look at what mathematics is and what it's for. He's come to understand that a rigorous and relevant mathematics curriculum means different things in different academic areas and has helped the rest of us find ways to organize our thinking and our programs around the needs of the students and the disciplines they're in. In our conversation, Uri reflects broadly on the systemic change he's been a part of and roots it all in the deep pleasure he's found in the classroom, whether it's a freshman pre-cal course or a graduate seminar. Uri's been a great gift to Texas, and I'm really glad we had this chance to talk. Here's Uri Treisman. Our audience is uh, individuals teaching in community colleges for the most part, you know, with a handful of administrators and support people thrown in. Yeah. But most of them are talking to practicing teachers. Yes. Like me. Yes. And that's that's actually where I was hoping to start, if we could uh, just visit about your teaching. And uh, you won, was it two years ago, the Piper Professor Award. Congratulations. And the Regents Award yes. this year and the Academy of Distinguished Teachers. It shows you how low the standards are for those awards. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think a lot of people think very highly of you. Well, so, so you teach uh, mathematics and, and public policy. That's and public policy. At UT Austin. Yeah. And so who are your students? They're the... Well, I also teach, uh, I've had doctoral students in four different colleges in the last few years. But I lo- I'm a mathematician. I love to teach beginning students in mathematics and doctoral students finishing their degrees. Beginning and end, yeah. alpha and omega. Mm-hmm. So the part in the middle, somebody else can take care of. Someone else can do with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So how many students do you have? I have 120 okay. freshmen. I have already memorized their names. I know their high schools. I have written for 45 years thank you letters to the high school teachers of all my freshmen. So about 20% of my freshmen came to me with letters from their high school teachers. Mm -hmm. And you create a community with your students. I mean, you want them to have a full experience, not just show up for class and take a test. Yeah, look, um, teaching is a bitch. Anybody who teaches knows how incredibly difficult it is. If we don't get the students to help us, <laughs> we're dead. <laughs> yeah, we are dead. And how do you do that? How do you get them to? I mean, do, do when they come in, do they kind of have a blank look? And you. So about twenty percent of them know me because I, when they walk in, I can usually name them. I say, "You're so and so. You are Mr. Malikar's student in AP Calculus." Mm-hmm. The other ones, um, I make the course extremely difficult with lots of support. Mm -hmm. High support, high demand, high support. Uh, The first end of the first week, beginning of the second, we do proofs that are difficult, but I know that they can get in a week of struggling. Mm -hmm. And we do an all-nighter. So we build a community of students, and 120 of them, and they have to learn that if something's hard, it's not because they are unprepared or very well prepared, It's because I am good at throwing things just over their head, Mm -hmm. and I control the level of difficulty. Productive struggle. So it's designed to be hard. The the challenge is part of it. Yes. In my class, if you get 100 on a test, 
you have to stay in, then I publicly apologize to the students <laughs> for me underestimating their work ethic. Mm -hmm. And they get harder problems if they get a perfect score next, on the next test. What are your th thoughts? Of, it's something I see sometimes in the in success uh, conversations around student success that people are get nervous when students are challenged. That if if you make it difficult, they might fail. There's risk. Um, do you ever hear that? Is that something you see? I occasionally students are scared shitless. Yeah, right. They're scared shitless that the kid sitting next to them is a lot smarter. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned from 45 years of real struggle with teaching is that most of my students are privately questioning whether they have the skill to really do this. Are they capable? Mm -hmm. They don't want to admit that. Some do. And then some are worried about whether they really belong. Like, you know, should I be in this class? Or can I really be this? Mm -hmm. And then a whole bunch of them are questioning whether this has anything to do with what they really want to do. It has taken the course that trusted. And if we don't help them come up with good answers to those questions on the first few days, mm -hmm. they are likely to start dropping out, pulling back their energy, investing in other things. And some of that is that, that voice in their head that said, I don't belong here, I'm not able to do this. It gets See, louder everyone, if you don't speak that's right. to that concern. And it's not only women, it's not only yeah. people of color, it's a lot of you know, white guys from Dime Box and from mm -hmm. rural Texas. They're looking at the people next to them who've had AP calculus and sophomores or juniors, and they go, oh my God, who are these people? Yeah. yeah. Right. These people have never touched a living animal. <laughs> but man, do they know calculus. <laughs> yeah, so you've got to connect with them in a way that they feel like you, they're not the only ones that are uh, worried about that and people can rise to, they can rise to this. First thing I do is I ask, future farmers of America, up here, group photo. Boom, those kids walk out together wow. from small towns. 4-H, uh -huh. I want all the 4-Hers up here. Uh -huh. Got any scouts in here? Got any veterans in here? Right, mm -hmm. and then they start seeing that there are people like them in the classroom. Uh -huh. often like them hiding mm -hmm. and if you honor them and if you honor their teachers by telling them that they are lucky they will thank God for the teachers they've had mm -hmm. then they understand that they can trust you and that you know them as people they're not just some numbers going through some machine and we've all been on the other side of that you have a doctor who sees you as a bundle of symptoms or what, whatever the context is. You, they're, they're not just a student, they're a person. That's right. Where did you learn this? Well, community college. You know, I was like 23 or something. You know, needed a job. Mm -hmm. I walked into, you know, Pierce Community College in California. And they said, well, what do you want to study? And I said, well, whatever will get me a job, ma'am. Mm-hmm. And she said, no, you need to have a program of study. And I said, okay, tell me which ones lead to jobs, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, what do you like to do, Mr. Trisman? And I said, well, I like to hike. She said, you're in the horticulture program. And I had fantastic teachers. And then I'd, take, I'd go to classes at the community college near my job site because I was working 40 hours. Mm -hmm. And I go into LACC, Los Angeles Community College, and this guy, Jack Stutzman, Man, I don't know why, but he took me under his wing, and I felt like my father. I just thank my lucky stars for having him. And he knew who I was, and he shepherded my life. And what I'm doing for my students is a small payment for what he did for me. That's how it works. Everybody has a story like that, a professor that, that saw them. Yeah, hey, my parents didn't have any education. My, mm -hmm. my stepdad worked on the streets paving asphalt, mm -hmm. and their aspiration was that I graduate from high school. Uh, I actually wanted to be a farmer. That's what I wanted to do. Had a farm for a year in New Jersey. Uh -huh. 90 acres, a quarter of alfalfa, uh -huh. 29 cows, 8,000 chickens. Wow. And I learned, man, there's a hell of a lot easier ways to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were in the horticulture program, is that right? At Pierce, yeah. At Pierce, okay. All right. And so were you going into landscaping? 
well, you know, what I was going into is working for grounds and maintenance mm-hmm. in Los Angeles Community <laughs> College okay. System, which fed me, uh-huh. and which is work I liked outdoors. So now, whenever I go to a community college, which I do a lot, I always go early, and I see if that place is loved. Mm-hmm. And I look at how they're pruning the trees and how they're taking care of the grounds. And you'd be surprised how much you know about a campus by looking how well it's taken care of. Mm-hmm. And you can tell in five minutes by just sitting down, hanging out with the people taking care of the place, do they look at the students? Do they feel part of the place themselves? If they don't, the students aren't going to feel part of it either. And that that's a leadership question, too, that if the people doing that feel like they're educators and very much a part of the education process, yeah. th- it's a very different culture at that sort of institution. You go to Northwest Vista when I was there. You go to uh, Sandy Shugart's places, Valencia. Mm-hmm. And it feels like you're in a community center. And you go to other places and you feel like you're in a gas station somewhere in the Midwest where people drive up, get filled up, mm-hmm. and then drive home and at 3 o'clock on Friday there ain't no one there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, you, know, you got to really know what you're doing when you teach. You can't teach stuff you don't know. Mm-hmm. But if you're teaching at a gas station in the Midwest, it's like really hard to teach. But if you're teaching in a place where the kids feel they belong there, mm-hmm. and that's the collective work of everyone who works there, man, your job is easier. My, uh, my personal hero is Frederick Olmsted. <laughs> and he says a lot about what uh, the, the design spaces we live in, uh, the impact that has on a democracy. He, right. The reason he designed Central Park, he said, was, was you can't have a democracy without outdoor spaces like this. So that's right. Yeah. And Central Park looks pretty beautiful these days. <laughs> it is. So, uh, so you, you had a teacher that taught you how to teach. Well, I had a teacher who modeled respect and home base and he taught me mathematics. But then when I was went on to school at UCLA, I mean, they were just wonderful to me. And when I was a graduate student, I had a master teacher, Leon Henkin. And he forced me to design. I wanted to learn how to teach. So they, you know, I wanted to be a teaching assistant. And they gave me a job. Now, I'm a working guy. I'm not like one of these people who, you know, whose parents are PhDs. And they said, okay, if you're going to teach this section, just go take a book and teach. And I said, wait a minute, who's going to train me? Yeah. And they go, what do you mean, who's going to train you? I said, look, you know, I mean, I, I don't hire people. And why, you know, if I'm getting a new guy to help me in grounds and maintenance, I train him. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, no, you just do what to them what we did to you. You were successful. <laughs> And he was tongue-in-cheek doing that. And I asked him three times. He said, okay, you're responsible for training the teaching assistants. The only way to learn how to teach is to teach other people how to teach. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I went to the library. I was scared out of my mind. I went to the library. I took out books like how to teach, sort of like how to weave a rug, how to wire a lamp. (laughs) 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 And there was this wonderful thing that was popular at the time. So this was like before most of our listeners were born, Mm -hmm. when teaching experiments was a big deal. So I organized for the teaching assistants at Berkeley in math a program around teaching, doing experimenting with different ways to solve teaching problems. Mm -hmm. And it became pretty evident that I didn't know how to solve any of those problems. But doing this course really taught me to keep improving, keep experimenting. And 45 years later, Every year I have teaching experiments and I have spelled out in my diary what I'm going to try to get better at mm-hmm. and how I'm going to enlist students and colleagues to help me get better at it. Now, I like to teach 120 students. Some of my colleagues at ACC, uh-huh. they have like five classes in different subjects with four preps. Yes, yeah, so 200 they, students. Maybe. Yeah, so I have, you know, anyone listening out there, man, I have an easy job compared to you. <laughs> Well, now in your spare time, uh, you run the the Dana uh, Charles Center. A. Dana Center at UT. Uh, yeah. What tell tell us about that? What, how how long has that been around, and and what is your role in it? Well, I created it in nineteen eighty seven, mm-hmm. 
I had gotten some award uh, for a few years before that when I got stuck on teaching. So this is an important background. We're looking for teaching problems. So I asked my TAs, well, what problems would be valuable for you to know about? Mm -hmm. So this was the 60s, 70s, and they said, we have, for the first time, we have Latinos and black students on our campus in number. We used to have like three, now we have 50 or 100. Right. And they were having a hard time making it, even though they were the valedictorians of their high schools. So they said, how could you, how could we do better at this? So I was stuck on my dissertation. I was really seeing that I couldn't just be a math person. So I took uh, 18 months off. I moved into the dorms. I interviewed, I followed 20 African American and 20 Chinese American students. I learned Cantonese. And I followed them on dates. I interviewed their families. I lived in the dorms with them for some, some weeks at a time. And I wanted to really understand what my students did when they left my classroom and whether I was having any effect on them at all. Mm -hmm. So this project, which was all about procrastinating on my dissertation, all of a sudden wins the MacArthur Genius Award. Mm -hmm. Completely out of the blue. <laughs> I'm always famous for things that have nothing to do with my job. <laughs> Says a lot about my work. <laughs> it's the things that get you out of doing your yeah. work. It becomes your work. So this foundation in New York, this wonderful group of people, the Dana Foundation, Bob Kreidler, who was Eisenhower's, one of his chiefs of staff and linked to Congress. Mm -hmm. He said, you're going to give this guy an award and we're going to fund him throughout his whole life. So they've given me money to create a center. I brought it to Texas in 91. And unlike most centers, it has no advisory board. It's basically paying back the community for the gifts that I have gotten as a teacher. And we work with community colleges, restructuring program, remodeling. All this language about transformation is too fancy pants. It's more like remodeling your house, uh -huh. uh, improving instruction. We work in K-12. We develop things that are used by half, almost half a million low-income high school mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. We provide support for the heads of mathematics of most large districts in the country. Then we took on the homeless program for the state of Texas. We were on that in the Kinevento. And then we run a gigantic service project, which started from my own students to teach them about service and leadership, that now has given 1.75 million hours of service to low-income kids in East Austin and won the Governor's Volunteer Award last year. Congratulations. Stick around for more of our interview with Uri Treisman. But first, let's find out about some upcoming events for our community college folks in Texas on November 6th, 7th, and 8th. The Success Center will be hosting its third annual Pathways Institute in San Antonio. This program will give people at colleges that are implementing Guided Pathways an opportunity to work with their teams in focused programs, as well as connect with colleagues across the state and hear from researchers in the field. You can find out more on the TAC website at tacc.org. And be sure to make your plans to attend this year's TCCTA convention up in the Dallas area. This is the largest gathering of community college folks in Texas, and there will be lots of programs covering more than 50 disciplines, as well as teaching hacks and time to meet up with friends across the state who share your passion for teaching. Visit tccta.org for all the program and travel information. Now, let's get back to the conversation. Teaching as a professor is the greatest job in the world. You can do anything the hell you want, as long as it's not too illegal. And I don't get why some of my colleagues are all into the privileges of the profession, but it's all becoming a poor. It's always seemed to me that the responsibilities of the profession are equally important. And the data center is about service. And where a lot of the pleasure in teaching comes from. Yeah, I got 90 colleagues. Most mm -hmm. of them have been practicing teachers for much of their lives, mm -hmm. working in the support of other teachers. And who are your students? Well, my students at UT are my friend. I always, for undergrads, teach freshmen. Mm -hmm. And then I always teach, I, every freshman year I pick four students who I follow all through their lives. And those students uh, make a commitment to do something extraordinary. 
So uh, last year's crew, I had Michaela Smith, who is now in, in England. She's a Rhodes Scholar. One of my students is doing a brilliant service project and is in the PhD program at Caltech. Uh, Jessica Olivares uh, was top service student in the Cockrell School of Engineering. Low-income kid from the Rio Grande Valley, 3.97 GPA graduate. Mm. And she's working on forensic architectural engineering. She's interested in building structures in communities that are devastated, low-income communities devastated by floods, earthquakes, and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And now I just picked my new crop of four wonderful students who are going to do things that they are proud of that reflect their values and hopes, not mine. Mm -hmm. My job is to help them be leaders. See, when you look at UT... It's very, you know, like ivory tower kind of place. And there's stuff chiseled into walls about our purpose is to transform lives for the benefit of society. And we teach leadership and citizenship. And it never says who's responsible for doing these things. It's just chiseled into the wall. Mm -hmm. Like, that's enough. The kind of imperatives in the passive voice. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it seems like we, the faculty, mm -hmm. the people who actually teach, mm -hmm. are the ones who are going to do that if that's going to happen at all. Mm -hmm. So I reserve a certain number of hours a week of my time to pick students and actually see if they can live the values that the university claims it teaches all students. I'll take my 12, and I hope that my colleagues will take their 12, and so on. Do they, do they ever meet, connect with each other? Oh, yeah, they hang out. Yeah. They hang out. Now I have Enrique Vargas, who's building a, a, a surgery program for urban uh, magnet schools. Karen Katuria, who's building a core facility to help students learn biotech skills, working with local community colleges. Uh, Abby Nevins, who's now formed the Breakfast Club, a very novel nonprofit for taking care of uh, elderly in residential housing who have no mm -hmm. supports mm -hmm. and who's connected with all the leading nutrition students around the world, studying their volunteerism and service. Fantastic. So if you're teaching four, five classes with four preps, mm -hmm. you should be jealous of the privileges that mm -hmm. guys like me at UT have. <laughs> now, who are your students in... Uh, in the Dana Center? Well, the Dana Center are professional staff. Mm -hmm. So I have my freshman students, mm -hmm. my undergrad students. I have 90 colleagues, and they range from uh, highly seasoned professionals. Carolyn Landel, yes. my managing director, who has a degree in biochemistry from the University of Chicago. We spoke with her last week, I believe. Martha yeah. Ellis, who was twice a community college president yes, and an assistant vice chancellor. Doug Sabdi, who is a leader in the setting of math standards around the country. Mm -hmm. So I look around for people who are smarter than me and know how to get stuff done and have ideas, and I made a home base for them. And then we have tons of teachers who have been department chairmen, leaders, and they come to develop supports for others, mostly community college, but not only. Now, uh, and a uh, project you've worked on that has had an enormous impact is around creating multiple math pathways for yes. students. So, so this is my apology to the universe. <laughs> 20 years ago, I was a leader of the Algebra for All movement. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that for so many of our beloved students, it would be Algebra Forever. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out, as a practicing mathematician, Algebra is really important, mm -hmm. but it's only one of the things that's important. Mm -hmm. Statistics is important. Mathematical modeling is important. Mm -hmm. And it just struck me, why are we making all these people who want to be, so many, you go to community colleges, people want to be firemen, policemen. They want to be EMT. They want to do the things that our communities depend on. Mm -hmm. And we're making them factor trinomials until they die. <laughs> so I thought... And that be, keeps them from... 
in some yeah. cases from becoming what what is truly valuable. For I them. have interviewed no end of people whose lives have been blocked, upward mobility has been blocked by stupid math requirements. Instead of teaching them math that they can learn that's important, we let history dictate what's important. Well, the, the, the concern I've heard faculty raise, or, or just people raise, is that we need to have a rigorous curriculum, and algebra uh, is, is uh, coterminous with college uh, level. So what's the, what's the problem with that argument? Uh, first of all, algebra is critically important, mm -hmm. and algebra can be taught rigorously mm -hmm. and non-rigorously. Yes. What you actually have when you visit developmental math classes is islands of beautiful practice by extraordinary teachers mm -hmm. and a lot of part-timers, in some cases hired by temp agencies, using some terrible technology to deliver bad instruction cheaply. Mm -hmm. So let's not imagine some perfect world of algebra teaching. Mm -hmm. But so the question is rigor. What is rigor? What rigor is as a mathematician is a check on an unfettered enthusiasm, on our wishful thinking. Rigor means precision. It means attention to detail, logical inference. Statistics can be taught with rigor or not. Algebra can be taught with rigor or not. So we need to ask the real question, what are the skills that our students need? What are the habits of mind? Any effort to weaken rigor is a betrayal of our profession. But the only core, the idea that the only course that has rigor is algebra mm -hmm. is so indefensible that all the 17 professional societies of mathematicians have now debunked that idea and formally recommend. So there are places where faculty are arguing for that. And they are arguing for the right things, but they need to get out more. They need to see that their professional societies are insisting on rigor, but also insisting on the curriculum be relevant mm -hmm. to the particular pathways. And thank God they're in mathematics, because there's no end of rigorous mathematics mm -hmm. that could be taught. Well, and often it seems the, the, this concern is raised by non-mathematics faculty, um, that if, if you're teaching psychology or sociology, um, uh, algebra just is the, the default, and of course, do, do that. Um, so yeah. it is, I mean, do you run into that? that uh, now, you got to remember, the audience can't see what we're doing here. Maybe there's a photo, but I'm old. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have pictures on the, uh, yeah. on the website. So I am old. <laughs> so I look back. I remember when people argued that if you take solid geometry and spherical geometry out of the curriculum, mm -hmm. it will not be rigorous. Mm -hmm. The 12th year of high school is only rigorous if it has spherical triangles and generalized law of sign. And before that, it was classical Greek and Latin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And before that, it was analytic geometry of a certain arcane type that is of no relevance to today's engineering programs. Mm -hmm. So education... Well, I had Latin, is, and, and, yeah. and I benefited from that, and my daughters did, so, and I so had, shouldn't everyone. And I think that students should have a broad education. Mm -hmm. Latin, you know, hey man, if it's taught in a way that teaches you to analyze text, to confront powerful ideas, sure. Mm -hmm. I studied Semitic, Proto-Semitic languages, Akkadian. I studied Sumerian, Aramaic, right? Arabic and Hebrew. And that was an incredibly rich part of my life as a doctoral student. No end of things you can do when you're procrastinating in your dissertation. <laughs> but if we're talking about community colleges and four-year institutions, we're talking about a broad education that prepares people for constructive engagement in society and for many a first job with their eye on the second or third. As a mathematician, algebra is a central subject of the discipline. 
but it requires that you've had lots of experience in simple manipulation. If students haven't had that and they want to be a fireman or a journalist, wouldn't it be helpful for them to actually have to analyze data with rigor? Mm -hmm. So that's how I feel. I am not anti-algebra. I love algebra. Mm -hmm. I, use, I use it every day. Mm -hmm. But I also know that the most common use of algebra in American society is helping your kids with their algebra homework. <laughs> so let's get real so, here. So statistics might be the, the more valuable and rigorous uh, track for, some, for many students. And for some, mm -hmm. uh, basics of proportionality, ratio with some algebra mm -hmm. taught at a higher level for novel application. Mm -hmm. Arithmetic and basic algebra are incredibly deep subjects. Mm -hmm. The only way to teach them is not with long lists of technical skills that they might use. I love the fact that if you teach biology, almost nothing you teach is older than 20 years old. Mm -hmm. If you teach psychology, the Yerkes curve goes back to 1910 or 12 or something like that. The newest thing we teach in our algebra courses is the solution of the quadratic equation. And actually, we now know that the Babylonians had, knew how to solve cubics. Mm -hmm. So it was published in the ninth century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we should have at least something they learned that was thought up in the last thousand years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm setting a low bar it's, here for the discipline. It's time. It's time. Well, no, all right. You said something a minute ago I, 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 that I know our, our folks care about a lot. I, I'm very interested in the subject. You, you were talking about... Uh, a broad education, thinking a career or two ahead, uh, or even thinking beyond a career, thinking about uh, them as, as human beings and adults in a democracy. Um, that I spoke the other day uh, for this program with the person who runs the welding program at Austin Community College. It's a phenomenal program they have, and they, they do um, welding for code code welding for like yeah. where they know the city codes and things like that, but they also do um, art uh, welding and and jewelry making. Yeah. And his background is in music, and uh, so he has graduate degrees in music. Uh, had no idea he was going to wind up doing this. Um, in this world of of guided pathways, um, there I mean, what makes it interesting is that there are tensions. I mean, right. if, we, if there were one problem, we would just solve it. Yeah. The fact that we have multiple considerations uh, yeah. to include uh, make it interesting and difficult. But what do we do with students where we want, they, they, we want to get them on, on a track early, and we're starting them very early with dual credit, where they're acquiring credits at a young age. And even with those credits, we want them to declare a major which means they're going to be on a track. They're going to be, they're going to be taking this type of math instead of that type. Um, how, do you, how do you think about this question? Is, is there a tension there? How do, you, yeah. how do you talk to a student about their future in a way that expands their possibility? And, and, uh, yeah, this is very difficult. First of all, we're building pathways. We're not building prisons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? When you build pathways, one would expect that large numbers of people are going to want to jump over to that other pathway over there. Yes. Because many students, what's happening now is that when we force students to make decisions early, they're making the decisions that, in fact, re-stratify society the yep. way it's currently exactly. stratified. That's right. And all the research economists have shown that just asking students to pick a pathway could be the worst possible thing we doing if we care about reducing income inequality. Mm -hmm. So, so you build, to, but you have to build a system that anticipates jumping from one pathway to another. That's right. And how do you do that? Well, that is really, that's the challenge of the mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. I think, for example, um, if, if you looked 20 years ago, before 2000, when people improved their lot in society, upward mobility took place within a single industry cluster for most students, most, most citizens. Mm -hmm. You were in healthcare. You stayed there and you advanced. You worked in sales and insurance. You didn't change over to art. Mm -hmm. 
in about 2000, when the structural change in the economy was disrupted that pattern. So more and more people who are successful jump across industry sectors. So the pathway idea has some roots in an old economy that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We have to be clear that the things that allow upward mobility across pathways actually are mathematics. Mm -hmm. So those students who start with statistics, that program is successful when they come back and say, you know, I'd like to learn some algebra. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing in the data center pathways. Very large numbers of people mm -hmm. who would die in algebra and now go through a stat course and they say, you know, I can do this stuff. So we have to design pathways with a very broad common base that teaches students how to learn, how to question constructive skepticism, not cynical skepticism, Right, what used to be called the general education <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that we, has to be the base of the pathways. But we have so many. There's so much intersectionality among our students. Uh, the income uh, uh, range is enormous. Uh, ethnic backgrounds, age. You're asking uh, a high school junior to make a, a life decision. At the same time, you're asking a 30 year old. A adult returning to college and and we're asking the same question of both students how do we do that in a way that that recognizes how different those questions okay. are for those students so you're not young either you're not my vintage uh, but you're old enough to have seen Saturday Night Live and Dan Aykroyd yes doing Leonard Pimp Garnell bad conceptual art, <laughs> bad ballet. I remember. Yeah. Bad path. We need him to come back and do bad pathways. <laughs> right? Which are designed like narrow tubes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Climb on board, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> You're going straight into insurance sales. Yeah. Well, that is also a betrayal of the mission of education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, helping students to pick fields and explore them mm -hmm. with some intention, with a situational interest, is useful, as long as we teach them not to do so with blinders. Mm -hmm. But after recessions, so I'm old, right? After recessions, people tend to focus too narrowly on the economic outcomes of higher education in the short term. Mm -hmm. When we have periods of economic expansion, and oh my God, please, we're ready for another one, right? Then people start recognizing that a broader education is the best preparation for life. Well, and, and the way students make decisions changes. I know, uh, I think for a younger student, they may still be in sort of a concrete operational uh, uh, developmental stage where choosing a major has to do with getting a job, and getting a job means something they've heard of, yep. and okay, I, that's a job I've heard of, so I'll major in that. Uh, well, it's hard to major in anthropology if that's the calculation, but you can get a degree in, in anthropology or philosophy and have an amazing career. Right. But it, it requires some maturity and understanding of how all this works. It, it is true that different choices of major have economic implica implications. Mm -hmm. right? And it's important that students can make an informed choice about what they're studying. Because in fact, there are some students who really are in a position to make that choice. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud that UT, in its uh, new on-course work, in its work for advisors, yes is deeply focused on how to avoid the pitfalls of HP, the potential pitfalls of HP5. The question for us as educators is how do we realize the best hopes of that legislation? Yeah. Everyone, even the people who wrote it, were aware that poorly implemented it would be a death trap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, there were a lot of conversations that legislators were having that what, what are we really creating here and what are the unintended consequences? Yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, the, the, the tension is between that, that narrow tube that just goes straight from A to B, and they, 
they're locked in once they realize they, they chose the wrong tube. Um, and then just an incoherent environment where they don't, they don't know right. even where to begin the process of deciding. So we, you know, so those of us who are privileged to teach in places where we have first generation students, mm -hmm. uh, that is a very special privilege. Mm -hmm. That's like me, that my teachers. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that the pendulum effect, we can easily go from a curriculum where we hand students a course catalog that looks like a pork roast <laughs> and say, figure it out, to a narrow tube. You're going to be a forensic architectural engineer with a specialty in business, something or other. Mm -hmm. And we have to implement these things with integrity, more than fidelity, implement them with common sense and with the long-term interests of our students and our society in mind. What could happen in the absence of good leadership is we take this as some mandate, yeah. right? Yeah. We have enormous right. freedom in how we implement these things. And, 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 I, and defending that, the latitude and, and having that discretion is, is going to be an important part of it, that this is our role as educators. And defending that is an important role for our professional organizations. Mm -hmm. That's why we join them. Mm -hmm. I was talking with uh, some people at Brazosport College the other day, and this this question came up, and I I may have been the one that brought it up, but we were talking about how do how do you do this advising in an authentic way that really is in the interest of the student, and they they were talking about how they uh, they don't want it to be so directive and so yeah. once and for all but they they also recognize the the problems of, of the, they call it the cafeteria model the, where the student doesn't know even how to begin thinking about the question and what uh, one of the people said was that she thinks of it uh, of each student how would she advise someone she cares about knows and cares about well that's a very different that way of thinking like about Linda it Nueva. Uh, it, it was someone close to her, yes. Yeah, yeah. Linda I very much is this one. I love, the, when I was down in Brazosburg, I was so impressed mm -hmm. by the thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. And as a kind of thoughtfulness comes from being from sort of coherent community. Yes. And now that's one of these cases where it's an oil, you know, we know the economy of that region. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot, you know, they have some advantages that other places don't have. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, uh, we were working on a module uh, around uh, uh, program mapping. Mm -hmm. And so much of this gets in the weeds where you're, you, you're dealing with a lot of kind of inside baseball uh, uh, issues. But these things make a difference. And you really do need to go through it with that kind of care. And, but for them, with all the, the technical considerations they had in mind, it was a very human system they were creating. Yeah. I see it at St. Jack, yeah. um, Odessa, uh, Victoria, through the University of Houston campus. Uh, I, yes. So this is myth about us, you know, especially a map, but not only that. Somehow people who don't actually live on community colleges mm -hmm. have this myth that there's this large group of people who don't like students whose job is to block them, they, 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 they need to actually visit us. Mm -hmm. I was at a Harvard. I'm going back to give a lecture at Harvard next week. About six months ago, I was at Harvard, and there was this guy from the business school. I just wanted to, like, wring his neck. <laughs> Big shot on disruption. He said, you know, the problem in our two-year colleges, we don't have enough innovation. Mm -hmm. I'm going, sir... You must have visited community colleges on the outer planets. <laughs> I think perhaps you might try one on one of the inner planets. The problem is too much innovation and no uh, you know, coherent management mm -hmm. of people's hard work. Systems change has been a big uh, interest of ours, uh, mine and, and our folks uh, the past couple of years. We've really seen so many complex disruption initiatives happening on top of each other. I mean, Pathways is an enormous disruption 
and it's happening at the same time that dual credit is exploding. Yeah. And how many other things are happening at one time and managing that and doing it in a in a controlled way that you're trying to actually create something and not just react to the latest sure. stimulus. One of the problems is an army of professional transformers. Mm -hmm. So like Harvard you have them. We don't have as many at UT, but we have some of them. It's so this is why I teach every semester. The, the rare time, like when I have too many national commitments that I can't teach, educational reform seems a lot easier. <laughs> right. The transformation has this language. It sounds like a philosophy course. Mm -hmm. I think we should get rid of that language and call it remodeling. Yeah. It's like remodeling your house. Right? You say, first you've got to deal with what you got. Pink socks. Who the hell was I when I bought those pink socks? Right. The gray slacks with the pink socks? Mm -hmm. We have those in our higher ed. <laughs> this is not a dignified enterprise <laughs> remodeling. <laughs> so this is trapped in all this rhetoric of this and this. And I worry that people forget this is actually about what they do every day. Mm -hmm. And it's about their relations with each other and with their students mm -hmm. and with their community. Well, and creating feedback loops where people at some level of abstraction, if you're at the coordinating board or a state agency or a state association and you're not in the classroom with students every day, uh, you, need, you need to find direct access to that insight because those teachers yeah. and those administrators see things that you miss otherwise. So you guys do a good job of this because you're mostly about teaching. Yes. Right. Yes. And it is important. So, like, yes, I do teach doctoral level courses in system change. Mm -hmm. And we talk about neo institutional theory and mimetic isomorphism and all of this stuff. But if that stuff is not connected, mm -hmm. you know, to, like, it's really hard like, to think about the change in two year colleges if you can't actually name 20 people who teach in them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, changing a computer system is very different from changing a human system. Yeah. And then, you know, the problem is there's not enough innovation. Really, sir? Well, that that's kind of a safe thing to say because no one is going to challenge that and say that's not true because it's always true. However much disruption well, and innovation is, it, they yeah. <laughs> I don't feel you know. I don't feel any obligation to those people. <laughs> Unless they're working with my students and helping my community, the hell with them. Well, and there's also just specific ideas. I know in the 60 by 30... And I'll tell Texas you, I had dinner with those folks. Go ahead. Yeah. And someone actually told the joke in French. Uh -huh. And then I knew these were not my people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were uh, uh, talking with the, the folks at the coordinating board about 60 by 30, and mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the and the overall goals are something that our, our members are very supportive of and, and have been involved in for a long time. So, I mean, it's, it's a very easy thing to, to understand that, yes, this is a direction or issues we need to be dealing with. Yeah, I mean, it's the but, right idea. But people think that 60 by 30 is the size of a bat they're being hit with. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. Hey, Joe, get the 60 by 30. Yeah. It's hard to <laughs> whack these sons of bitches. It's bigger than a two by four. It's it's yeah. <laughs> sixty by thirty. Yeah. <laughs> right. But in fact, uh, Raymond and David and the team there, Jenna and Julie, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they really care about st you know. Yes. I mean, they're in a very difficult political situation, but they actually really care mm -hmm. about the system mm -hmm. and to make sure it serves people. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how difficult that is in a legislative session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I know we're concerned about the 63-hour uh, official state goal that students don't take more than 63 hours to earn a 60-hour credential. Yeah, well, and that's we're, crazy. Well, it, it's attempted, not earned, so it, it means that students once would ever fail a class or drop a class or take a class that didn't apply to the major. And we just, that that's one of those things that if you're a teacher, you instantly know that you know there's an issue with that, and so we we 
uh, you know, we have conversations about it, and we want to provide the kind of feedback, constructive feedback, that helps people who aren't directly connected with those students to, to understand the reality of it. Yeah, so what we have in all legislatures is a lot of low-information people. They care about a few issues, mm -hmm. hopefully that actually reflect the desires of their communities. Mm -hmm. But they have to do thousands of yeah. things that they have no expertise and interest in. So they come up with these 63, you know, this doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And the question for us is, as teachers, is what are the vehicles through which we help them understand that this is stupid? We, have to, we need our organizations, and we need to be active in our communities. Mm -hmm. You know, at the barn, or at the bar, or at the restaurant, when this guy's sitting down and, and campaigning, and say, you know, sir, I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. it turns out that teachers have a lot of credibility in their communities. Yeah. you got to say, hey, you know, this doesn't make any sense at all. Well, and the, the feedback we get from legislators is that they care tremendously about those unintended consequences, and they, they worry that they're creating something they didn't intend, and, and so that feedback from our members uh, is heard. It's very effective. Yeah, so we have a problem, and the problem is that when Texas government works, it usually works because of an active business community civil rights community, and a network of professional associations mm -hmm. working to reconcile competing interests. Mm -hmm. Legislatures are machines for reconciling competing interests. So you need extra governmental forces that hold to long-term strategic plans. The problem is, when legislators get too partisan, then business runs away. Business needs rationality. Mm -hmm. Professional organizations are accustomed to using tools of logic. Mm -hmm. And when it's about raw partisanship, everybody loses. Mm -hmm. So let us hope that our legislators learn to govern, get better at governing, and reduce their tribalism and focus on what the people of Texas actually need. Now, there are some good examples of this, but wow, are there some bad examples of this. Well, there are, and, and it helps when you're dealing with issues that, that haven't been identified as, as partisan. And it does seem with community colleges, uh, you know, we, we've been able to work very well with Republicans and Democrats. And yeah. So there is, there is a space. Sometimes those other factors get involved, but to a large extent, I think we've been able to base arguments on the merits. Um, but it requires direct involvement by constituents. Yeah. Well, there are things we teachers can do in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. There are things as teachers we need to do in our departments. There are things as teachers we need to, to affect our students, the very students in front of us in class. Mm -hmm. Some of that can only be done in class. Some of it has to be done in the department, in the college, mm -hmm. in the community, and in our state. And the question is how we collectively cover all those bases. Or and your, that's the role of our professional associations to help us with. Or in your all-nighters with your students. Yeah. First, <laughs> the students have to come first. Yes. Yeah. Because there you confront truth. That seemed like such a great idea. And then we confront reality. Teaching is only for people who are accustomed to dealing with humility. Mm -hmm. I, I worry sometimes about people sitting around a conference table convincing themselves of this brilliant idea that as soon as it touches the air outside that room, <laughs> it, you have to deal with all these other forces. Yeah, teaching yeah. is a complicated craft, skill, science, and art. Mm -hmm. And uh, you read about it, and it feels like someone is studying you through a telescope on another planet. Mm -hmm. It's sort of right. They got the geometry right, but mm -hmm. there's something missing. Mm -hmm. Kafka wrote this beautiful le love letters to Milena, to his wife or fiance, and he talked about that as the letters went over the sea, the passion and that stuff <laughs> dropped out of the letters into the ocean. <laughs> 
So some, some image I remember from reading that, that years ago, and that's sort of what happens when you look at people talk about what we actually do every day. Mm-hmm. And how do we do that when most of us are sent into battle completely unarmed? Well, you were sent into a class, and they just said, te- you know the material, so teach the class. <laughs> and you, you recognized there was more to it than that. Yeah. I was thinking, like, all right, there's a tree. There's a tree. Go plant it over there. <laughs> well, it turns out that planting a tree is not trivial. It just looks trivial. <laughs> right? Nor is farming. Mm-hmm. You know, God only knows what we terrible farmers that first few months. <laughs> <laughs> And, and teaching and, and teaching is something that can't be done in isolation. It, it is something that uh, you have to tend to the environment it's occurring in. Look, we put a new teacher in a classroom in a, in a place that's disorganized. And if you put a teacher in a place where teachers don't collaborate, that individual has to set all the norms of responsible behavior in the classroom. Mm-hmm. If you're part of a department that is coherent, everyone ex- has the same expectations, so it's infinitely easier for a new person to teach. It's like really hard to teach when everyone has different expectations of what excellence is, what the curriculum is, what you need to cover. This is a collective effort. This is a team sport teaching. Mm-hmm. And... In good leadership, you see teams of teachers working on behalf of individual students and students collectively. And you know when you've walked into a department with that kind of culture. Absolutely. It, instantly. If there's no relational trust with the leadership, teaching is even harder than it is typically. When there's high levels of relational trust on the campus, it's so much easier to deal with the truly difficult things you have to face. What was that book that came out years ago, Bowling Alone? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he talks about how things that are impossible in one context just happen without a second thought. In That's the right. Other. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Speaking of books, uh, I've been asking folks on this program uh, for books that they've read that they would like uh, our listeners to, to know about, and it can have to do directly with the work you do, or it could be a historical biography you read. Any, anything you think our folks uh, need All to right. know about. Let's make a, a wide selection. All right. For those of you who want to read a wonderful novel, mm-hmm. of the few I've read recently, Lily King's Euphoria just charmed me. All right. It's sort of a, I think she was thinking it's sort of a fictionalized Margaret Mead type of character, so it has an anthropological undertone, but it's a beautiful novel, Lily King, Euphoria. Euphoria. Now, for educators, I enjoyed Paul Tufts, uh, How Children Succeed. Mm-hmm. It's sort of an exposition of the ideas of Carol Dweck, and it digs into, with some texture, into the Angie Duckworth and Carol Dweck ideas about mindset and grit. And I think it, it's a deeper look at it than you get from just reading an academic paper or going to a workshop. And then some of you are math people out there. Mm-hmm. And one of the big advances in math, in statistics, has been structural causal modeling, which is the hot thing. So there's finally an easy, almost popular book to read about it. And it's called, uh, called, I wrote down the name of it. It's by Judea Pearl. Beautiful book. The actual name is Causal Inference and Statistics, a primer by Judea Pearl. Okay. And this is interesting because Judea Pearl is a brilliant computer scientist and philosopher, one of the great computer scientists of this day. And he wrote about doubt and uncertainty, and he developed a better mathematical theory of causality and skepticism. And his son, Judea Pearl, was the newsman who was beheaded by ISIS. So think of the irony and the pain of one of the leading philosophers of doubt having his son murdered by people who have no doubt. Mm -hmm. But this is a beautiful piece of mathematical work. If 
for you math people, think acyclic graphs, but think that it's, it's accessible. To a popular audience. So. To a popular audience that teaches those algebra courses. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I, it's been a privilege uh, getting to visit with you about this and uh, the work and that you. you... Well, the work that you're doing here in Texas is, is uh, having an enormous in, and direct impact on our members, and I think we're all benefiting from just the chance to reflect on on what we do and how we do it and, and the way you've come at it in a way that allows our members to engage with it. They're not just on the receiving end of someone else's idea. They're, they're creating this in their, in their space. My dream is to reclaim the mathematical lives of a million students a year. I can only teach 120 students a year. I want to join with all my fellow math teachers and make sure that we are never a barrier to people's hopes and that we can fuel their upward mobility and the enrichment of their lives with our subject. We cannot allow our beautiful subject to be used in ways that are anathema. Right? So yes, we are comrades, we are colleagues, we need a joyful conspiracy on behalf of our students to free them from stupid courses <laughs> and to put in ones a mathematical value that are worthy of our discipline and worthy of our students. Let's do this together. Yeah. Uri Treisman, thank you so much. My pleasure. That was Uri Treisman. You've been listening to The Pathfinder. Be sure to join us next week when we speak with Wanda Mercer, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and David Troutman, Vice Chancellor for Institutional Research and Decision Support in the University of Texas system. We'll be talking about the close look they're taking at dual credit in Texas. If you like this show, tell a friend, subscribe, and leave us a review in Apple Podcasts. Share one of our episodes on social media. You can visit tccta.org to listen to our shows or grab them in your favorite podcatcher or wherever you found this one. The creator of The Pathfinder is me, Richard Moore. Our producers are Carol Hawkins and Gabriel Zambrano. This has been a production of the Texas Success Center and the Texas Community College Teachers Association.